Good morning, everybody. Great to have you all with us. Welcome to the Stand Conference 2020, session number two. Uh, we were going to be covering uh, creation and Stand evolution. Stand Conference 2020, but, session um, number two. But what, sorry, I just had extra audio going off in my ears there. Um, um, and I'm here. So today we're going to be covering this particular topic with Steve, which is, can one make rational sense of the world without God? It's really a look at logic and how we need logic to uh, share the, the gospel as a, a, a key tool and how lots of people use it uh, to their own advantage. Uh, it's great to have so many people um, joining us, whether you're able to be live and, and watch the stream or whether you'll be uh, viewing this later on. Um, I'm, I'm Phil Chambers, uh, one of the steering team of No Apologies with me and presented today, Steve Falcon, And not, not online today is Dr. Harvey Ward, who's had some um, medical matters that he's needed to attend to today. So we've delayed his session till after Easter. Uh, so we might as well make a, a start, Steve. Um, I'll hand over to you and uh, take it away. Okay, um, so the I suppose that the, the session that I want to talk about today is um, logic is one part of it, no doubt, and it's probably a sizable part of it, but um, it really boils down to this, is that frequently Christians get frustrated because they present evidence and the evidence seems compelling in their mind and yet is not compelling in somebody else's mind and that can lead through frustration and it's really the the question not so much of whether evidence is right or wrong but the question why why do people react differently to evidence and is the evidential approach necess of necessity the right way to go about um sharing your faith sharing your worldview sharing the gospel obviously to get to the gospel there's a lot of other things frequently that have to occur before somebody's even willing to listen to the gospel and you know frequently christians get into this idea that they should sort of step into some kind of um neutral zone that in, actually doesn't really exist but in their minds or their opponents tend to draw them into this neutral zone as if to say they should abandon their own worldview and, and approve the Christian worldview without actually using Christianity as such. And um, I think that is a approach that simply doesn't work. And it's not just from a pragmatic perspective that it doesn't work. There's good reasons why this doesn't work. And that's what we're going to look at today. So um, what I want you to, I guess, no, and remember, I'm going to throw around a lot of facts, and this isn't about facts. This is about um, methodology, and this, this is about confidence. This is about certainty, and it is um, really giving you tools to share your faith in ways that you may never have come across before that should give you a degree of certainty that you're actually standing on something really solid. You won't be able to remember all the facts, and that's and we're going to give you some resources that will be linked to the YouTube um, session that um, will give you further reading, some books, some not, you know, long, some more longer ones, some not so long. There's one particular small book that's like a really small summary. I think it's only about 70 pages. You could read it in an hour. And it's a tool that I think would be valuable in terms of reading it a few times. Because And ultimately, the 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 tools that we're going to sh show you today are things that, that you become good at by simply practicing them regularly. And you'll be surprised how, how good these tools are in your everyday um, discussions, not just over religion, but some of these tools are actually really valuable to have in discussions over topics like politics, believe it or not, you'll be surprised. So the, the important thing is, and this is probably one of the mo most frequent charges levied against Christianity, is that Christians have what's called blind faith and they're irrational. And um, nothing could be further from the truth. It is actually the opposite. 
And so what, what we're aiming to do is show you that, that Christian faith is rational. And then in fact, um, you can't even make a rational argument without the Christian faith being true. Um, very few people actually argue with rational consistency. Um, we will see this. Um, and so, but of course, bearing in mind and remembering here that we, we always want to do whatever we do with grace and respect and kindness, remembering that there was a point in time when we weren't, a, we weren't Christian either. But I want you to walk away with um, a certain degree of certainty. And the Bible actually has a lot to say about certainty. Um, it, it, it's not that um, faith is something that you take a blind leap into the dark. Far from it. The Holy Spirit actually gives certainty. And there are a number of references in the New Testament that we're not going to look at in this session. But if you look just for the, for the word certainty in the New Testament, you'd be surprised what, what you'll come up with. So why does it matter? Why should we even care? I'm going to initially um, have a look at a few examples that I just mentioned, that sort of hinted at, in terms of um, in terms of why we we should care about this. And so here is a typical um, evidential argument, and I, I think it's a very compelling argument, um, and it, it's it's the moral argument, basically saying if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values do exist. People, of course, will argue over this, but deep down, I think everybody knows they exist, whether they accept it or not. Therefore, God exists. It's a compelling argument because it it, it does show that that the only reason why we can have objective moral values is if there is a God. But this argument is is not an ex easily accepted argument, and there's good reasons why people don't accept this and it's they don't accept it not just because of evidential there are actual moral reasons why people don't accept this argument and you can see the comment there you may have been reading it while while i was speaking and here's a, a harvard university professor basically showing us that if objective moral values don't exist we have we we don't even have a justification for saying that genocide or slavery are wrong, and of course everybody intuitively knows that things like genocide and slavery are wrong, but their worldview is not consistent with the idea that this is wrong. Because of course, as a materialist or a naturalist, as in somebody only believes in matter and energy, well they've got no they've got no way of of justifying why such a, an objective value exists and of course they'll come up with all sorts of other reasons why they actually don't exist so another exa example here is frequently used in apologetic encounters is the kalam argument which is basically an argument from cause and effect every cause has every effect has a cause so whatever begins to exist has a cause the universe began to exist therefore the universe has a cause so and of course is not nothing so the, the the general materialistic view of the origin of the universe um is that the universe basically nothing exploded into the universe which of course is a complete reversal of this this particular argument so this argument is a very compelling argument and yet again um it is not accepted by the greater majority of people and I will suggest as we walk through this, that there is a reason why people don't accept this argument. And so this argument is not the solution to our problem. This is just an interesting one here. Um, so this is a popular survey on two different aspects. Um, one is on the, the idea of whether Jesus lived and one whether the earth is approximately 6,000 years old. And it is interesting that both sides of this appeal to bias to defend either whether it is true or whether it is false. So both sides use the same kind of um, methodology and come to the completely completely different set of conclusions. I don't want to dwell on this too long. Um, this is another one that's quite interesting here. Does religion harm society? Um, and you see here, obviously, you know, people think, well, Santa Claus actually is harmful. The, cl the claims of Santa Claus myth remain false, even if they have a positive effect on society. This is one for the, sorry, for the positive side. And the claims of quantum physics remain true, even if they ultimately have a negative effect on side. So, you know, the, the, the issue here is not 
um, whether religion harms society. The issue here is how this is being argued. And sometimes you can successfully demonstrate that something has a negative effect, and yet it doesn't follow that the claim is false. And then this is, of course, here, you know, we, we could argue that religion has a negative effect on society, and that does not mean that religion is false. It's, there's a fundamental logical issue here. So um, what, what's missing, and then this is the, the, the problem that I want to hint at and that we're going to get into a little bit more detail, and this is um, early on in the book of Romans, Paul um, says something very powerful that I think is hinting at us why we have issues when we try to present the gospel with evidence. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all on all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what can be known about God is evident among them for, because God has shown it to them. Um, so there is a, a clear thing here that in God's mind, there are no real atheists. Of course, there are people who profess to be atheists, but in God's world, there are actually no atheists. Deep down, everybody knows God exists. This is basically what God is saying here. And unbelievers suppress the knowledge that they actually have. So there are basically two categories of people in the world. There are those who profess their belief in God and those who suppress their belief in God. This is effectively how God sees it. So when Adam sinned, he died, and the effect of this sin is, was radical. It was radical in a moral sense that, of course, we, we have ever since um, been born as sinners into the world, so we are morally defected. But um, this moral defect has also has a effect on the way we know things, the way we understand things. It has had also an, in, uh, an intellectual effect on us. Theologians will call that the noetic effect of sin. It has an effect on the way we grasp truth. And so the, 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 the problem with the reason why evidence frequently does not work in an apologetic encounter is because people have a different starting point. People have a starting point from their sinful nature versus Christians who have a starting point that is not from their sinful nature. That's why Christians can look at evidence and come to a totally different conclusion than a non-Christian does. And so, so you have this um, kind of situation here where um, both sides are looking at evidence. In this particular thing, we're looking at an image from, from cr evidence over versus creation versus evolution. But it is really the, you could replace cr um, creation and evolution with simply the believer and the unbeliever here and, and replace that with all sorts of different aspects of, of our worldview. So clearly evidence doesn't have a voice. So if you pick up a rock and tr try to figure out how old that rock is, the, ev the rock's not going to tell you. You have to interpret the data. So evidence isn't the problem. It's, it's the evidence needs to be interpreted. Evidence can't speak. And so when, so when a creationist looks at a comet, he concludes the solar system is young. When an evolutionist looks at a comet, he concludes there must be an Oort cloud and hold that thought for a moment, and we'll be looking at rescuing devices next. So re creationist examines information in the DNA and concludes there's a creator, whereas an evolutionist looks at the same information and concludes that mutations or some unknown mechanism has generated this information. An evolutionist examines similarity in the genetic code of various organisms. He concludes that they have a common ancestor. The creationist looks at those same similarities and concludes they have a common creator. You see, so clearly the evidence is of necessity, not necessarily the problem here. The problem is, is if you like, the glasses that each side looks at the evidence and they can come to mostly the opposite conclusions. And so that's, of course, a problem. And each side, and I have to say this also uh, in respect of both sides, both sides have what's called rescuing devices, which I just earlier mentioned that that um, funny word, Oort cloud, for those of you who don't know what that is, we'll see that in a moment. So both sides have rescuing devices as they look at evidence. So if we looked at um, just a simple thing of carbon-14 dating, this is a method of how we, we work out 
how old things are. So imagine, to, to make it really simple, imagine you have a bucket of water with a small hole in the bottom and you drill a hole. As I said, you've, you've filled the bucket with water. You've drilled a little hole in the bottom. You can watch it drop out and calculate how long it would take to empty the bucket. That's sort of how carbon dating works. In a sense, carbon is the breakdown of, um, of carbon inside um, things like rocks, and etc. And this breakdown um, has what's called a half-life. So half of the carbon is gone within the half-life period of that, as in carbon-14 in this particular instance. And the carbon-14 half-life is, I think, 5,740-odd years. Um, this allows scientists to roughly calculate the age of samples by working out how much C14 is left. So um, the interesting factor here is, and we'll come, but we'll hold that thought in a moment. For a moment, C14 decays to an undetectable amount by approximately a hundred thousand years. So effectively, um, you can't work out anything that's older than a hundred thousand years using the C14 method because there's none of it left, basically. And of course, this is a good indicator from the creationist perspective of the young age of the Earth. Um, and so let's have a look at some of typical rescuing devices. So if we if we think of comets, comets are constantly losing material. This is, by the way, observed science. So it's what you would call an operational science. We can we can look at that and we can figure that out. It's not something that we we have to go back in time to to come up with um, models. So roughly, it has been observed that a typical comet can last approximately 100,000 years before it runs out of material to lose. Of course, this poses a huge problem for an evolutionist. So he reaches for the rescuing device called, called an Oort cloud. And basically, this is an imaginary hypothetical sphere far beyond most distant planets. Occasionally, bits from this cloud dislodge and become new comets, thereby solving the age problem of the universe. Of course, the, we, we must recognize here that no one has ever seen this cloud so it can't be proven to exist but it can't also be proven to not exist it's simply an explanation to overcome a problem that evidence has caused and so likewise people come up with this idea of saying well you know diamonds must be billions of years old even though there is um the C14 method, of course, would refute that. So they say, well, likewise, there's some unknown cause um, of C14 contamination that allows us to think that diamonds could be millions of years old after all. So and the important question here is that should we criticize a rescuing device? And, and you, the answer might surprise you. And the answer is no, because rescuing devices that the, are things that are legitimate in science because science don't scientists when they're looking at a particular um, subject matter don't know everything the whole point about science is, is that we're discovering new things all the time the point is that a rescuing device just can't be arbitrary so if someone says um, the center of jupiter is made of green cheese well that's an arbitrary statement that's certainly not a valid rescuing device and and here's an example of a creationist rescuing device it's important to understand that creationists have them too. Distant starlight problems. So imagine the, the evolutionist says that the universe must be billions of years old as it takes that long for light from the most distant galaxies to reach the Earth. Now, that is something that we observe. And there is no currently known consensus in the creationist community as to what the solution for this problem is. Because, of course, it, it, it does. Um, pro provide a serious problem for the creationist community. And here the creationist also reaches for a rescuing device. Since I'm not an astronomer, I'm not going. I'm going to refrain from trying to explain how that one works. Just believe me for a moment that the creationist has a rescuing device here to deal with the distant starlight problem. So um, I guess what I want you to take away from this point is that each side, when you're looking at the evidence has rescuing devices to deal with problems that they have not solved. Each side claims to have solved problems. And if you're just looking at the evidence and you listen to somebody on either side of this argument talk without understanding what their worldview is, you will tend to 
believe what they are saying because because frequently what they say makes sense and that's the problem that people find themselves in they and they they reach what 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 i would call a mexican standoff well this doesn't solve anything and here is the, herein lies the problem that it isn't an argument over evidence that solves the apologetic problem the the argument here is can each side justify why they come to the conclusions that they do and this is the point where you will find that only the christian has a justification for coming to the conclusion that he does and in fact the the materialist the unbeliever actually has to use christian the christian worldview even though he will not readily admit this he has to use the christian worldview to come to his disagreement with god in fact to raise any argument against god an unbeliever has to presuppose god and this is the the the, the real issue and the real death nail i suppose and the real if you like bulletproof vest that you have as a christian and this is something that's really important to understand and so before we move further it, I, I want to make this really clear as a christian you should never think of the idea that you should go to neutral ground and set the bible aside and set your christian worldview aside and try to just prove that god exists outside of using any of the um christian tools if you like to do so which is exactly what we had at the very beginning these arguments the kalam argument the moral argument because they just simply aren't convincing to somebody who presupposes that god doesn't exist this is the real problem now so let's have a look at, at worldviews to understand why a worldview or what makes a worldview valid and so worldviews must be internally consistent devices. In other words, if a worldview is inconsistent, it's not valid. It, it's like um, if you make an argument, if you say one and one is three, well, um, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that that's an invalid statement because it's inconsistent. It's a wrong argument. Of course, you know, simple maths tells you that. And of course, more complex arguments need a little bit more than just simple maths to figure out that they're that they're wrong but the point is is that even worldviews must have consistency to be valid and so if we look at um these are three particular worldviews and and uh, they are probably the most common ones that exist today we're only going to look at them at a very very high level and usually people have a mix of at least two of them generally people most people that i have encountered are, are relativists and materialists some people are empiricists but generally the, the materialist and the relativist is, is, is the person you will meet in this day and age. And so basically at the very high level, relativism asserts that absolute truth and absolute morals do not exist. And there's varying degrees of relativism. So there can be personal relativism, cultural relativism, and, 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 and so on. But this is a self-refuting claim, given that absolutes must exist in order to make an absolute claim. Because this is an absolute claim, an absolute claim that absolute morals do not exist. And of course, absolute morals have to exist or absolutes have to exist to make an absolute claim. And of course, to claim that they don't exist, they have to exist. So it's it, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Empiricism asserts that all knowledge is gained through observation. Sounds good at, at you know, when you think of being a scientist. Um, I, I would say that a lot of knowledge is gained through observation, but all knowledge is gained through observation, again, is a self-refuting claim. Ask an empiricist how he can know that this assertion is true. And of course, he can't know because the assertion itself can't be validated by observation. So again, it's a self-refuting claim um and and it is so therefore is has to be by definition invalid materialism the idea that everything consists of matter and energy alone so what do the laws of logic consist of as an example and we're going to be going into those in a lot more detail the materialist cannot consistently answer this claim hence his view is internally inconsistent therefore of course if it's inconsistent it's invalid 
and this is probably the um, number one issue that we therefore de have to deal with and what's what um, is known as the preconditions of intelligibility and so if you if you like to have an argument over whether God exists or to have any kind of discussion over anything certain things must exist and they must hold true for you to be able to do so and I've just listed um, five of these here but there are really probably you know 10 15 even more there's lots more um but we don't have time to look at them all these are probably the five major ones that i think are really important to understand um and so number one we must be able to rely on our senses a worldview that cannot account for this is internally inconsistent you think of a worldview of, of evolution where everything consists of random chemical processes so you imagine the, the 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 neurons firing in your brain have no um transcendent value attached to them because you have no consciousness in in a sense of um you, you know there's no soul there's no meaning there's no there's no absolute rights and wrongs there's there's nothing to ground any of these chemical reactions in and because you're living in a world that's constantly changing, because the whole idea of evolution is that everything is constantly changing, otherwise, because the change is what drives the fact that you even exist. If there was no change, then you wouldn't have changed from a monkey to a human. So you, you cannot know at what level of change the person you're talking to is, whether he's at a higher level or a lower level of you. You can't know whether anything that you're saying to him is true. See, it's inconsistent. The materialist must accept that all knowledge is based on random chemical processes firing in his brain. That's really important to understand that. And of course, um, when, when pressed on these issues, materialists, of course, will fight them. But they, that is the consistent um, result of, you know, that is the result of being consistent with his own worldview. So he cannot be certain that his fire, that his brain will not fire totally differently in the future, like just tomorrow. He doesn't know whether his brain's going to be firing in the same way or firing truth versus not truth. He doesn't even know what truth is. He cannot account for why we know things and why we can communicate. Why, why is it that we can open our mouth and verbalize words and somebody else on the other side of that communication can actually understand any of these words? Because there's no reason for that to be so if everything was just random rarely do people consider the consequences of their worldview whereas the biblical christian can account for this because we're all made in the image of god and we're made with the ability to communicate with him and with each other and so think about this in the same way this goes for the reliability of memory now, you think of the laws of logic, the law of non-contradiction, as an example. It must exist for us to be able to have any meaningful discourse. Even to raise an argument against God, the law of non-contradiction must exist. But, of course, if you think of in terms of a materialist, he says that everything consists of matter and energy. So um, that means the law of logic um, is something that, you, uh, you know, you can touch something you can feel, which of course is not true. That's nonsense. And um, the laws of logic must have existed prior to the universe being in ex being called into existence. So therefore, they can't consist of matter and energy. So that they, they they would be called a precondition, which is w w what um, this slide is all about. Is preconditions that must exist for us to actually be able to meaningfully communicate. So these laws are not man-made inventions or conventions. And it's, this, it's the pressing of this particular situation that pushes the person who holds that worldview um, to accept the consequence of his own worldview. The law of cause and effect is another one. It's a universally true law without which no science is possible. Yet the very foundation of the atheist worldview, nothing exploded into the universe and created everything we see, is a total reversal of this law. So again, this is a precondition for which any kind of science is made possible. In fact, any kind of communication. If, if the law of cause and effect didn't exist, then we wouldn't exist. 
and therefore nothing would be possible. The, the uniformity of nature is, a, is another one of these things that is really important to grasp and understand. It's the inductive principle, the assumption that the universe is logical, orderly, and that it follows mathematical laws, and that these are consistent over space and time. Now think about this, that um, in, the, in the material evolutionary world that relies on the reversal of this principle for its entire um, justification, because if, if everything is logical, orderly, and unchanging, then, of course, evolution is wrong because evolution relies on the fact that everything is changing con continually. But, of course, science can only be done in an environment where if I do an experiment today, I can repeat that experiment tomorrow and the day after or in a different circumstance or by different people. And the very fact that... I can repeat this experiment is what the whole basis of science is all about. In other words, science relies on this um, uniformity of nature, and yet evolution cannot account for this. The, the unbeliever's worldview cannot account for this at all. In fact, it, it needs it to be reversed. So the the biblical creation reveals to us a consistent universe over space and time, anchored in the nature of the very God who created it. So that that's um, really an, un, un, important to understand that in able to have any kind of argument, these preconditions must exist. Only the biblical Christian can actually account for these preconditions. It's what, what I um, would call a transcendental argument that um, it's, you argue from the impossibility of the contrary. In other words, um, God must exist in order for us to know anything. God must exist in order for us to be able to explain anything. And so for, in order for us to raise an objection to, against God, God must exist. It's like trying to explain the, the laws of logic. They are self-evident. Um, they must exist. The law of non-contradiction must exist in order to be able to explain the, the law of non-contradiction. So the sum of your presuppositions, so presuppositions are like pre-beliefs. They are in, encapsulated in what we were just looking at, these preconditions. And these, this is the, the, the real issue when we're looking at evidence. Uh, the presuppositions that somebody brings to the table when he looks at evidence is basically, if you like, the set of glasses that he has that he looks at the evidence. That's why the unbeliever will look at the uh, at the world and and come to the conclusion that the world evolved, and the Christian will look at the world and, and come to the conclusion that the world was created. So the, the evidence isn't the problem. It's the glasses that each person looks at the evidence that is the problem. And it is these presuppositions that um, that need to be highlighted to the person whom you're talking to. Because when you deal with these presuppositions, the person is pressed to accept the con consequence of their own worldview. And it, it is, if you like, arguing, for, as I said, from the um, contra it's arguing from the impossibility of the contrary. So... The, the, these presuppositions are self-evident. They cannot be proven without them existing themselves. And that's really important to understand. Some things um, cannot be proven without presupposing them. So you can't prove that the laws of logic exist without presupposing the laws of logic. Therefore, the laws of logic are self-evident. Same with the law of cause and effect. They transcend any argument about itself. And so, so the, the, these laws, they, they must be presupposed in order for us to make any argument. They must exist outside of us. And therefore, of course, they, they are, in effect, proof that we didn't create ourselves, that we didn't come about from um, a random accident, that we didn't come from nothing. They prove that God is the one who is behind it all. They prove, and, and, and far from just proving that they, they prove God, they actually prove the biblical God. That's another subject altogether um, that will require more detail, but there's a whole range of aspects around 
these preconditions of intelligibility that would um, contradict, let's say, an argument that you can have um, multiple gods or that you can have only um, a non-Trinitarian god. There, there are really interesting aspects to all of this that actually in and of themselves prove that the Trinitarian god of the Bible is the one who, who created it all. And it is not surprising when you think about this that God in the Bible says that he created man in his own image and he effectively put into man um, if you like a stamp of himself and what man does is he goes about trying to erase that stamp but every human being on this planet knows that God exists they will of course not necessarily readily admit that and in fact more often than not people fight that idea but deep down, underneath the surface of all their arguments is a um, innate knowledge that God exists. So, so where do we go from here? How do we deal with this in, a, in, a, in, our, in our daily apologetic encounter? And it's interesting, there, there are two passages of scripture in the Old Testament, two Proverbs right next to each other, and they seem to contradict each other. So, so um, don't answer a fool according to his foolishness, or you'll be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his foolishness, or he'll become wise in his own eyes. So they, they seem to be like an a, apparent contradiction, but they are not. They actually complement each other. And so effectively what, what verse 4 is saying is don't join the evolutionist in his own worldview, because otherwise what will happen is you'll become like him. But rather for the sake of argument, you, you don't abandon your own worldview in order to explain to the non-believer that the Christian worldview is the right worldview. Don't ever abandon the Bible in your apologetic encounter and your sharing of the gospel. Don't ever um, say, move to a place where you just put the Bible aside. But at the same time, in verse 5, you, you basically... You know, do it like this. So, so you would be arguing, well, in a hypothetical world, if we say this and this and this, then that would be the consequence. In other words, what verse 5 is really telling you is um, a term which Greg Barnson um, coined, which is pushing the antithesis. So what you're saying here in verse 5 is to the unbeliever, you push his worldview to, his, to the consequence of the worldview in order to make the person recognize the folly of his own foolishness. By the way, the word fool here is nothing to do with intellectual um, foolishness. This is to do with um, a moral attitude towards um, God. So we're not talking about somebody who's not intelligent. Frequently, atheists are very, very intelligent people. So, and, and, and we should never um, treat people in, in a way of thinking that they're, they're not intelligent just because they... They um, proclaim not to believe in God. This is to do with a moral attitude towards God. As we saw in, at the outset in that passage in the book of Romans, um, the person that Paul was referring to there who's suppressing the knowledge of God, that is a moral suppression of God's knowledge that God has placed in this universe. So just to reiterate, don't join the person in their worldview as if to say, don't make an assumption that their worldview is is true and try to prove God's worldview from the aspect of theirs because you will never be able to. Rather, press the person to understand the consequence of their worldview, to recognize that in their worldview, they can't know anything. In their worldview, they cannot make sense of anything. And the only way to make sense of the universe and to make sense of reality is recognizing that we are all created in the image of God. So clearly, this is the important point to recognize that we know God exists because it's impossible that he doesn't exist. That's really important. And if you walk away with nothing else, then that is the sum summation of, of this argument. And it is an effectively if you like a bulletproof argument, it's not going to be an argument that you will convince everybody with, but um, because some people, as we just saw, they are, will morally not, are not willing to, of course, to be convinced. And it needs 
also the interaction of the Holy Spirit to change the disposition of a person's heart. But what you are in effect doing is removing Well, we seem to have lost Steve's stream there a little bit. Uh, we're just wondering if we can get him back online. Non-biblical worldview is impossible to be correct. Now, um, in the process of this, there are a whole range of different things that occur and um, that I would call logical fallacies and Sadly, lots of Christians fall into this trap as well. And it is really quite important to understand um, how to recognize a logical fallacy, how not to use them, and um, how to point them out in the other person's argument. And again, this isn't, a, is, this isn't a, an act of one-upmanship that you, you're the expert in logic and therefore you can pick out when somebody else makes an illogical argument. It is more that you recognize where these um, logical fallacies occur and that you politely um, draw, make them draw the right conclusion rather than, than arguing over something that actually shouldn't be argued over because it, was, because it was logically false in the first place. So we're going to look at a, a range of these. Now, they're, they're, I'm only giving you probably the most important ones. And I'm going to give you some resources in the YouTube link that um, will give you more to read on this. And again, these are things that the more you practice them, the more they become second nature to you. And they are very, very helpful in, in, in all kinds of arguments. Believe it or not, actually, you will find if you listen, the next time you listen to people, politicians speak, you will be surprised at how many politicians use logical fallacies or you listen to news reporters, journalists, um, no one is, is, is um, free of this, this kind of trap to fall into. Sorry, so um, let's look at the first one, which is a strawman fallacy. Very, very common thing to, to do. And as I said, um, these are um, things that also Christians frequently fall into. And so it is important that we should not, we should avoid these logical fallacies at all costs because they only hurt our position. So a strawman fallacy is when somebody misrepresents the opponent's position and then proceeds to refute that misrepresentation. So it's like burning down the strawman. So you put up this false picture of somebody else's argument and then you proceed to kill that false picture and you walk away victorious and everybody thinks, oh, you've won the argument. But of course, what happens then is that the person will walk away thinking that you were right, will then re-look um, at all the facts or maybe hear somebody else's um, version of the, of the strawman that you burnt, burnt down and realize that you actually didn't answer the problem at all. So here's a typical strawman, just a very simple one. The Bible teaches that the earth has literal pillars and corners. Well, this is clearly wrong. Well, no, that's just a, a misinterpretation of what the Bible actually teaches. So the Bible uses figures of speech and analogy all over the place. And actually, probably a greater majority of objections that people raise against the Bible turn out to be just this, strawman fallacies, and they're easily refute, refutable. Faulty appeal to authority, which is very similar to faulty appeal to majority, and, and sometimes they occur in the in the same sentence so person x believes why person x is a doctor therefore y must be true well clearly that is nonsense um it can be true at times but it is of not of necessity here we're talking about a logical conclusion in other words why the conclusion of y is drawn from the premise of x and y believing sorry of x believing y and X being a doctor. These are the two premises. The conclusion is therefore why must be true. So main and, and typical words to look out for, mainstream science says or scientific establishment confirms. Those kind of statements immediately should raise an alarm that um, this is a faulty appeal to authority or majority. And, you know, um, 
this can happen in a in a in a in a typical Christian encounter argument. Ken Ham is an expert of the field of creationism, therefore it must be true. Well, that's just as equally a faulty appeal to authority. It's wrong because it doesn't follow. Ad hominem, very, very common. This is probably one of the most common ones that politicians will use as well. Really important to recognize this and not to, to use these kind of this fallacy in an argument. So you attack the person who made the argument rather than attacking the argument as, itself. Now, frequently the person making the argument um, is the right person to make the argument. So we may have a scientific situation going on and this person who's making the argument is a scientist. Therefore, you know, it's a natural human conclusion to, to react to that if, if you like. Um, but that's not necessarily always the case, as we can see in that number four there, Greta Thunberg uh, can't be right about global warming, she's just a kid. Well, that could be true, but it also could be false. But the point here is that we should never attack global warming, whether it's true or not. Now, I'm not saying whether it's true or not in this argument, um, so don't walk away thinking I'm pro or against global warming. That that isn't what this is about. The idea is that if you if you are a person who's um, skeptical of global warming, um, then be skeptical about the arguments, not about the person presenting them. So you cannot accept John's claims about politics because he can't find a job. Well, clearly um, that's nonsense. His his position about politics may well be totally right. The fact that he can't find a job has no bearing on the fact that he is right or wrong about his position on politics. Christianity isn't true. You were brought up in a Christian home. If you were raised in a Muslim home, you'd be Muslim. Now, <clears throat> that may well be true, but that isn't a truth statement about Christianity. And this is really important. These are very, very commonly lev levied attacks. And people frequently, you know, draw their tail between their legs at that moment and walk away thinking they can't answer this. Whereas, the right thing to do here is to just point out this is a logical fallacy, therefore you haven't made a point. Don't try and answer the point, point out that it's a logical fallacy. Bifurcation, another one of very common thing to occur. And again, I think it's important not to necessarily remember the names of these logical fallacies, but just remember the content. So here is a claim that only two mutual exclusive possibilities exist when in fact a third or more option does. So, you know, the number one is really easy to tell, the traffic light's red or green. Well, no, it could be yellow. Either you have faith or you could be rational. Well, that's a nasty one and it's a very commonly levied one against Christians. No, in fact, you could be rational and have faith. That's perfectly logical. Um, and in fact, I think it would be right to say that um, a Christian should be rational and, and should have faith and should never have faith to the exclusion of being rational. The Bible teaches that in Christ all things hold together. We, however, know that the force of gravity and electromagnetism are what holds the universe together. Again, these are two mutually exclusive possibilities, but and but there could be a third option here. And it, of course, the third option is is what it really is in this case that yes the bible does teach that in christ all things hold together but that the mechanism for holding these things together is what god uses to hold the universe together in other words the forces of gravity so there's a third option there so this one reification this also happens really often and as you as you as you remember these, as you as you practice them, as you reread them, um, there's a particular resource that I will give at the end of the video. It's a little book that's um, about 50 pages, and it has a, these in great detail with really cool explanations, more detail that I'm giving you in this presentation. And uh, it, it is uh, probably the uh, a book that I would highly recommend every Christian to read and become really familiar with because they are really helpful in your, in your um, sharing of your faith. Attributing a concrete characteristic to something that is abstract. So here we have a couple of really um, interesting examples. Nature has designed amazing creatures. Well, no, nature is an abstract concept. It has no ability to design anything. So that's nonsense. 
And yet, of course, you know, you would recognize these statements that they are used by all people very frequently. And I'm not now saying there's a hard and fast rule that you can never use them. It is, it is, they are not to be used in when you're making an argument about something. So the evidence speaks for itself. Well, no, that's not true. Evidence doesn't have a voice. It can't speak. It's people who interpret the evidence. God has designed humans with the intricate ability to create amazing things. Well, that actually is true, and that's not the fallacy. I hope you, you recognize that um, because God actually is a person and therefore he can design, and um, that therefore is not a um, reification. Equivocation, well, much easier to remember as the classic bait and switch. And this is when basically you use a word with a certain meaning and you switch the definition within the same sentence or possibly the same argument so that you make the, the you fool the person into believing one thing about a particular word and then he carries that forward into the next part of the argument and doesn't recognize that you've actually switched the meaning. So when you shift from one meaning of a word to another within the same argument. So doctors know a lot about medicine. Jason is a doctor, so he must know a lot about medicine. Well, no. Um, Jason might be a medical doctor, but it happens to be in this example, Jason is a PhD in philosophy, so he doesn't know anything at all about medicine. So you've switched the meaning of doctor from a medical to a PhD in that moment. Creationists are wrong with you see evolution happening all around us. Well, again, no, that's not true. You've, you've, you've implied the meaning. Here the word evolution only happens once in the argument, but you've implied the word evolution in the first part, and you've then switched that um, to, so how can I explain that better? You've implied the word evolution as being the, the source of all origins of life, because this is the evolution versus creation argument. You've implied that in the sentence, in the part of the sentence, creationists are wrong. And then you've switched to the meaning of evolution as just being change, which is actually a perfectly acceptable um, definition that also creationists would agree with. So you've switched that, and it's in this case, it's a lot harder to see, and therefore it's easier for people to be fooled by that one. Science has given us computers, medicine, and landed us on the moon. Therefore, we should trust evolutionary scientists. Again, here you see that um, there is an implied meaning. So yes, science has given us computers, medicine, and landers on the moon. Again, there's also a little bit of another thing there. Scientists have actually given us that with the use of science but never mind. And then you're saying here, so this is a operational definition of science and being switched into um, a science of origin. So they're two completely different definitions of science. But for the person who, who doesn't recognize that, of course, he therefore believes, well, because we've got computers, medicine, and landed on the moon, therefore scientists must be right about evolution. Whereas here, the, it, it, the the meaning has been equivocated. Begging the question, when an argument presupposes what it seeks to prove, this is also, sometimes this is actually hard to pick up, but it is very, very frequently done in arguments, and it is important to recognize this because this is something that, that you, that it, is used to fool you into believing something is true when it is clearly not. That it is not sufficient to to. How can I put it? If you pre if you presuppose what you seek to prove, you're proving nothing. Creation cannot be true because you would have to deny all that evidence. Um, well, you're the statement in and of itself, and this is important to to recognize here. In the contrary to all the other um, logical fallacies that we were looking at, the actual statement here can be right. So it can be a valid argument, but what's wrong is not the valid argument. It is the conclusion doesn't follow from the premise. So can it, creation cannot be true because you have to deny all the, that evidence. That conclusion that creation cannot be true does not follow from the premise. And whenever the conclusion does not follow from the premise, therefore um, the premise is just a, if you like, the conclusion is just restating the premise 
what that is is you're begging the question because you've not proven anything. All you've done is said the same thing twice. So the Bible must be the word of God because it says so, given that God cannot lie. Yes, that is a true statement, that there's nothing wrong with that statement as such, but it is presupposing what it seeks to prove. We know evolution must have happened because we are here. Again, the same thing. It's presupposing what it's seeking to, pro to, to prove. So if you deny the co conclusion, that's the easy way to figure out whether this was begging the question. If you deny the conclusion, you have to deny the premise as well. Uh, begging the question is, is, is something you really need to, to, to grasp. And as I said, uh, it would be helpful um, to do more study on this and to just let these things sink in. These are things that you, um, you learn by practice. Complex question. Excuse um, me, Steve. Yeah. Hi, mate. Just letting you know we've got one minute left of our time to go. So let's Yeah, and, and we're, we're actually we're remarkably close to the end. So Wonderful. Thanks, mate. We, we might go a few minutes over, but we're not, we're not going to be too, this is, we're coming pretty close to the end. We've got, I think, three or four more fallacies. Um, so the complex question is relatively easy to pick up. I mean, um, have you stopped lying to your constituents? Have you decided to stop cheating on your wife? Can you pick it up? Um, obviously, if you say yes or no, the implied idea is that you 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 can't answer your way out of the situation. Of course, have you given up smoking is, is probably a more commonly acceptable complex question because you'd usually ask the person whom you already know something about. But if you if you said you have you stopped decided have you decided to stop cheating on your wife? Well, if you say yes, that's implied that you did cheat on your wife. And if you say, um, if you say no, you, you equally are in that same situation. So, so it's a question that should be split up into: Did you ever cheat on your wife? And if so, have you now stopped doing so? And formal fallacies. These are formal fallacies in a sense that you, you have a like an algebra type argument to them. So if P, then Q, Q, therefore P. That's so you're affirming the consequent. That may be a bit of a mouthful, but if but the examples will make this fairly clear. If it is snowing, then it must be cold outside. It's cold outside, therefore it is snowing. No, that it, in, immediately you can see that that could be true, but it is not of necessity. Therefore, it's affirming what the consequence of which is wrong in this circumstance. So if the Big Bang is true, we would expect to see a cosmic microwave background. We do see a cosmic microwave background, and therefore the Big Bang is true. No, that does not follow because there is an alternative possibility. Denying the answer to this is almost the opposite of this. If it is snowing, then it must be cold outside. It is not snowing, therefore it is not cold outside. Again, that, that's wrong it's a wrong conclusion and sometimes these are easier to pick up when when you see in the argument so if 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 we found dinosaurs and humans next to each other in the same rock formation then they must have lived at the same time we do not find them next to each other in the same rock formation therefore they did not live at the same time now again here um the the two premises are of can be correct and the the conclusion could be, but the point here is they did not. In other words, we are denying that that is a possibility. And of course, that's wrong because they could be. So in, in summary, um, I guess, what, what would I want you to take away from this? And uh, this passage of scripture is a beautiful verse that I think we should really re almost memorize. Um, we should honor the Messiah as our Lord in our hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentle and gentleness and respect. It is frequently that it's only part B of this verse that is quoted. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope is in you. But actually, it's grounded in the fact that we should honor the Messiah as Lord in our hearts. And I think importantly to understand here is that that Peter is calling us to be ready to give an answer to everything. The, you know, to every challenge of our Christian faith, but grounded in that should be that we honor Jesus as Messiah and our Lords and our hearts. In other words, I think there's an implied grounding in there that we shouldn't abandon our Christian worldview in order to answer questions about our um, Christian worldview. And we shouldn't be putting, if you like, so to speak, God on trial as if to say, let the unbeliever rile and, and rant in a negative sense against 
um, Christ. And again, I think this is important to understand that if you go down the evidential aspect, this is precisely what frequently happens. Whereas if you if you push the antithesis, as I mentioned earlier, in other words, if you push the unbeliever to recognize the futility of his own worldview, then uh, and, and his his interpretation of the evidence is based upon his worldview. So his interpretation of the evidence is is not the issue here. The issue is his worldview. When you when you push the unbeliever to recognize the error in his worldview, uh, the evidence is no longer the problem. There is no such thing as neutrality. So it's really important, probably one of the most important takeaways here. As Jesus will frequently be saying, you know, if you're either against me or for me, you're either for me or against me. There's no middle ground in any of this argument. Be confident and certain about the biblical worldview and argue from it, not towards it. And as I said, we'll give you lots of resources in the YouTube link for further study. So I hope that was was helpful. And, um, and as I said, these things come with lots of practice. Okay. Thanks, Steve. That was uh, it was great to hear uh, all that work, all that uh, thinking, uh, structuring, putting things all together. There were some comments um, from our own team about how good we were, but that was uh, it was great to hear that and put it all together. Uh, folks listening, thanks so much for joining us. I hope you're um, taking care of yourself in this tricky and trying time. Uh, we will be taking a break on the conference for next weekend, which I believe is the Easter weekend. And of course, don't forget tomorrow, Australian Eastern Standard Time. Is Am I right in saying that we uh, do our daylight saving changes on your clocks tonight? Um, yep. Although, <laughs> that's it. No, no one will be late for church tomorrow. Well, you might. You might miss the live stream from church tomorrow. So thanks all for joining us. Don't forget to uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, ring that bell in the corner for notifications. Um, and do share these with your friends. This will be live, uh, not live, this will be on YouTube um, as a recording for people to come back to and visit and share with people later on. So uh, we'll finish the uh, the session now. And if you have any thoughts or comments, please uh, send us an email, send us a text, and um, we'll certainly um, get back to you on those things. Great having you join us. All the best. Bye-bye. God bless. Thanks, Phil. See you, Steve.